Okay, I think a story like the one that Jim just read to you begs for a little more uh, background, right? How many of you know the story of Hagar? Oh, that's a lot. That's great. Well, let me just tell you some more about it. Um, this is sort of like part two. Part one is that Hagar, an Egyptian woman, is enslaved to Sarah and Abraham. And Abraham has been made a promise. The promise is that he's going to be the father of a nation. Now, get this. Sarah is old. As the Bible says, it is no longer the way with her as it is with women. You know what I mean? She's really old. And so is Abraham. And so they're thinking to themselves, dude, God is promising us a kid, but we know we can't make one. I like to paraphrase the Bible. Uh, so, so what happens instead? Uh, Abraham feels it's in his right, um, and Sarah feels like it's in hers, to take the slave girl, Hagar, and Abraham goes into her, you know what I mean? And she becomes pregnant, but the baby is really the heir. The baby belongs to Abraham and Sarah. Now, Sarah gets an attitude. Why? Because Hagar's young, cute, she's got big brown eyes. No, that's not why. Um, Sarah gets an attitude because this woman has what Sarah doesn't have, what Sarah can't have. This woman has the heir. And in that patriarchal culture, Sarah having nothing and Hagar having the heir makes the slave elevated in that culture. Sarah's not so happy. So she begins to cut her eyes at Hagar. You all know what I mean by cutting your eyes, right? And giving her the look and popping her mouth and not really enjoying the relationship between um, Ishmael and Isaac. Okay. So Sarah whispers in Abraham's ear. They put Hagar out in the wilderness. And there she is in the wilderness with nothing but a baby. And she's thirsty. Now, if I'm out in the wilderness and I'm thirsty and I'm homeless and I'm poor, I'm probably feeling a little desperate. How about you? So she could have cried out to the Lord and said something like, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Or maybe she could have said something like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Maybe she could have just cried and said, how long, oh, Lord, before you'll see your servant and rescue her? Because those things have been said before. She does not cry out to God. She calls God. She doesn't cry out to Yahweh. She names God herself. She is the only person in all of the Bible that gives God a name. The only person that gives God a name. God tells Moses God's name. You should call me I am who I am. But Hagar, the slave woman, the homeless Egyptian poor person who's been made pregnant by a powerful patriarch, names God and calls God El Roy, the God who sees. The maid, the slave, the body that could be used, was used to have a baby that wasn't going to be hers, has a close encounter with the divine. And seeing God names God the God who sees. Now, back to what Jim read. She's out there in the wilderness, and she's destitute, and she's poor, and she's dying of thirst, and the God she has named, the God who sees, sees her circumstance and opens her eyes so she can see the well and the water that will save her. Don't you like the whole symmetry around being the one who sees and then the one who opens the eyes of the slave girl. In her naming of God, Hagar cinches the relationship between the divine and humanity. She makes a partnership. I hope this doesn't sound sacrilegious, but I think she brings God down to her by naming God. She makes God accessible, relevant, cultural, 
able to be appropriated. She makes God someone who she can be empowered by and share power with. Now, I need to say, because it's Pride Month, that Hagar is outed. She's put out. She's kicked out. She's set out. She's broke, homeless, pregnant. She's illegitimate without Abraham as the patriarch. She's outside of all of the bounds. An Egyptian woman in an Israel place, a, a foreigner, a stranger in a strange land. But even though she's outside of the parameters, God sees her, speaks to her, prophesies to her about the child and her circumstance. She's going to be the mother of a nation, just like Abraham. She calls God the one who sees. Out there in the wilderness, outside, set out, put out, God can see who she really is. She is a life source. She is a matriarch. She's a people maker, a nation maker. This is her identity. So here's what I'm thinking about in this Pride Month. There are many forces that make us feel like we need to hide. I was just with a whole bunch of clergy uh, down in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Sojourners had a summit. And you can feel in the room that some of the clergy, uh, these evangelical clergy, have to hide themselves. They have to hide that they're divorced. They have to hide that maybe they have had a drinking problem or, or, or a sex problem. They have to hide, some of these clergy, that they are LGBT-affirming because their congregations might put them out or not give them a raise or their bishops might make them lose their ordination papers. That's just hiding that you think it's okay to be gay. Some of them have to hide because they're gay and they have to live a lie in order to do their ministry. Some of us have had to hide who we are in order to survive. Our sexuality, our gender, our stuff, our, our issues, our problems, our concerns, the things with which we wrestle. We think if nobody sees them and nobody knows them, then maybe we will be all right. We hide because we have been taught that to be vulnerable, to be weak, to have a problem is a reason to feel ashamed. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? So we take it down the down low, and we keep it on the down low. And pretty soon, we have such a persona, such a false self in front of us that we ourselves can forget who we are and whose we are. When I think about lessons from a slave girl named Hagar, I would say there is nothing that can happen to us. There's no place we can go. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing that can be a part of our circumstance that God can't see and can't love. The psalmist says it this way, if I make my bed in heaven, you're there. And if I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I tell myself I'm going to run to the far ends of the earth, even there, your right hand will find me. Paul said it this way, will anything separate us from the love of God? No, nothing. Not demons, not angels, not powers, not principalities, not hunger, not thirst, not homelessness, not our sexuality. Nothing separates us from the love of God. Out there in the wilderness, put out, shut out, kicked out, in the wilderness, Hagar names God. God can see me. She brings God all the way down to be with her, 
to resource her. That makes me think about the incarnation, Jim. God comes all the way to where she is to make sure she has a skin of water to drink, all the way to where she is to save her life. So she lived. She survived. She thrived. She built a nation. Our God sees us and knows us and loves us. Not because of anything we do to earn it, not because we deserve it, just because we are absolutely God's peeps. God knows no status, no sexuality, no gender, no poverty, no issues or issues that keep us away from God's love. Out side of the frame. We're loved. <laughs>